Great. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah, for a very kind introduction, and thank you to Edmund for the invitation to speak at uh, this seminar series. Um, so, uh, as Sarah said, the, the, the title of my talk is The Amorphous State, Friend or Foe of, of the Formulation Scientist. And um, this slide just gives you an indication of the outline of the presentation and, and what I hope to cover in, in the time that we have available today. So um, many of you will know a lot about the amorphous state and, and what it is and, and why it's of interest to us um, and how it can potentially be our friend or potentially be our, our foe. Um, but I'll, I'll speak a little bit about just explaining for those of you who don't know so much about it, what we mean by the amorphous state and why it's of interest. Um, I'll go on then to look at some of the characteristics of amorphous materials, um, the good and the bad. Um, so what makes uh, the amorphous state of interest to us and, and both from a, a positive and a negative perspective, I guess. And then look at you know how we can harness the good aspects of amorphous materials and make use of amorphous materials um, in our formulations. And conversely, then, how we can avoid um, some of the bad aspects of handling and dealing with amorphous materials. Um, so first of all, what, what do we mean by um, amorphous materials or what are amorphous systems? Uh, so an amorphous material is a material that, unlike crystalline forms, uh, lacks three dimensional long range order. Um, and it has been described as a liquid that has lost its ability to, to flow or an extremely viscous liquid. Uh, so while uh, amorphous materials possess no um, three dimensional long range order, they do have some short range order. Um, so if this schematic here represents a crystalline material and, and this an amorphous material, you see that the amorphous form is much more disordered. Uh, so it's a disordered uh, solid state form. Um, and so if we think of a crystalline material as something like this, you know, nice repeating ordered um, crystal structure, um, an amorphous material might look something more like this, uh, significantly more disordered and, and chaotic, perhaps. Mm. Key aspect of amorphous materials that uh, we need to um, be aware of, um, particularly when it comes to trying to uh, formulate amorphous compounds and, and amorphous forms, is the glass transition temperature. Um, so amorphous solids can exist in two states. Um, we have what's called the supercooled liquid state and we have a glassy state. And so if, for example, we start off with, with a melt and you, and you slowly cool that melt, um, you will get uh, crystallization. Um, but if you rapidly cool the melt, you can avoid arrangement into a crystal form and instead produce what's called the supercooled liquid state. Um, so the supercooled liquid state is a viscous equilibrium liquid form of the material. Once you pass a particular temperature, which is characteristic of a, an amorphous compound, um, you can enter into what's called the glassy state, which is a solid non-equilibrium form of the same material. And the temperature at which you get this change from a supercooled liquid, or sometimes called a rubbery state, to a glassy state is this glass transition temperature or the TG. Um, and the glass trans transition temperature is very important uh, to know, as I said, when we're handling or using amorphous materials, because it's an indicator of the stability of the material and an indicator of the storage conditions at which we can maintain stability of the amorphous form. Um, so as a rule of thumb, for example, if we can store um, our material at a temperature around 50 degrees less than the glass transition temperature, we should have a reasonably physically stable amorphous form. Um, and that means that if we have a material and we know its glass transition temperature is high, we can um, have reasonable confidence that at room temperature, for example, it'll have pretty good physical stability. So in terms of handling and manipulating amorphous 
uh, materials. Um, some of our interest in, in a formulation context is to try and elevate the glass transition temperature or to keep the glass transition temperature relative to the storage temperature high enough that we uh, maintain physical stability. And I'll come back to that um, a little later. So some characteristics of amorphous materials. Um, how do we know we have an amorphous form? Well, as I said, these amorphous forms, they don't project, possess long range uh, three dimensional order, but they do possess short range order. So one quick, easy check to see, have you amorphous material there or have you some amount of amorphous or non-crystalline material there is to look at it on the uh, powder X-ray diffraction. And while a crystalline material will give you these nice distinct Bragg peaks, with an amorphous form of the same material, we'll see what's referred to as this amorphous halo, so a much more diffuse pattern in the PXRD. Now, on the downside, I've mentioned this issue of the glass transition temperature and how it relates to the physical stability of uh, the amorphous form. On the downside, amorphous materials tend to be less physically and also less chemically stable than their crystalline counterparts. And they also tend to have altered processability. And a lot of that altered processability, so handling in the various pharmaceutical processes that we have to put materials through in um, drug product uh, production, um, a lot of that processability uh, relates to the fact that amorphous materials, um, well, in, they, they tend to suck in a lot of moisture, so any moisture in the atmosphere, uh, that makes them sticky. It also makes them unstable um, and you have to be very careful about the handling of the materials um, and the temperature at which they're handled vis-a-vis uh, -vis their glass transition temperature. However, on the plus side and why um, we're interested in harnessing um, the good aspects of morphs materials is they do have higher apparent solubility and faster dissolution rates than their crystalline counterparts. So, so they are a higher energy form. And because they're a higher energy form, they have higher solubility, faster dissolution rates. And so for drugs where the, this is problematic, um, if we can use the drug in its amorphous form, we can improve these critical characteristics of the drug and the formulation performance. So in pharmaceutical product development and manufacture, the amorphous state may be purposefully generated to harness the positive aspects of amorphous materials. But we also need to be aware that it can be unintentionally generated. And when it's unintentionally generated, it can impact on the stability of our drug and of our uh, drug product and can also impact on the processability. Ways in which we can generate uh, amorphous material, as I said, both intentionally or unintentionally, uh, in a pharmaceutical manufacturing context would be by precipitation from solution uh, or by disruption of the crystalline lattice. Um, so these are sometimes referred to as a bottom up or, or a top down process. In terms of intentional generation of the amorphous form, Things like solvent evaporation, spray drying, freeze drying, co-precipitation can be used. Um, but unintentionally, we can sometimes get amorphous form being generated in, in other pharmaceutical processes uh, that we're subjecting our, what we hope will, will remain a crystalline material to. And that's things like wet granulation, drying or film coating. Uh, we can also intentionally generate amorphous materials by grinding or milling processes. Um, but again, in a, in a pharmaceutical manufacturing context, often these processes like grinding um, unintentionally generate amorphous material or an amount of amorphous material in a largely crystalline uh, form. And other, com other uh, processes like desolvation and compaction likewise um, can unintentionally generate some level of disorder or amorphous material in a largely crystalline material. OK, so having said that, 
you know, there's both positive and negative aspects to the amorphous state or to the amorphous form. How do we harness the positive aspects? How do we harness the good elements uh, so that we associate with amorphous materials? And, and why do we want to do so? Um, well, one reason why we want to use amorphous materials uh, relates to improving bioavailability from oral solid dosage forms. Uh, so, for example, if we start off with a um, disintegrating tablet formulation, uh, that tablet, when a patient takes it, will break up into smaller parts. And from those smaller parts, the active pharmaceutical ingredient will dissolve or will go into solution. And it is only when the drug is in solution that it can be absorbed, that it can pass through the gut wall and get into the systemic circulation. And in the systemic circulation, then if the drug makes its way around the body, reaches the receptors where it will have its uh, pharmacological effect and ultimately you get therapeutic clinical benefit. Um, what happens if the drug doesn't get into solution? Well, if it doesn't get into solution, then this can't happen. It can't pass through the wall of the GI tract. It won't get into the systemic circulation. You won't get an effect. And for many, many drugs, and increasingly for drugs that are coming through uh, the product development uh, uh, cycle, uh, we're seeing that a lot of these drugs fall into what's called the BCS class two and class four uh, categories. And, and this is the biopharmaceutical classification system. And in both BCS class two and class four, we have drugs that have an issue with their solubility. Right, so, um, and if drugs have low solubility, um, then there's going to be an issue with them dissolving in the gastrointestinal tract, and we're going to have problems with um, bioavailability because insufficient drug will get into the systemic circulation. Um, so class two drugs are ones where we have low solubility but high permeability, so it's only really the solubility aspect we have to try and manipulate. Uh, we also have class four drugs, which are even more difficult to deal with because they have low solubility and low permeability. But how do we overcome this issue of low solubility to improve uh, or with a view to improving bioavailability? Um, well, there's a range of different approaches that can be used. Um, and these are chemical processes, physical process, or, or process involving complexation. And so amorphization is one of the strategies that we can use to improve solubility because we're generating this higher energy uh, form that has increased solubility relative to the uh, crystalline equivalent. Um, and so we can purposely generate the amorphous state of the same pharmaceutical compound improve its solubility, improve its dissolution rate, and ultimately, we would hope, improve the bioavailability for these challenging uh, BCS class 2 and potentially also BCS class 4 compounds. So the solubility of the amorphous form and the higher solubility of the amorphous form relative to the crystalline form is an aspect that we as formulation scientists look to harness to improve the performance of our products when we're dealing with these poorly uh, soluble drugs. Um, if we look here, this is an example of a drug, uh, sulfadimidine, um, where the raw material, which is the crystalline form, um, has a pretty low uh, solubility. Um, that solubility is increased when we convert it to the spray dried amorphous form and is doubled in a in water where we have a PVP polyphenol pyrolidone in the water dissolved in the water as well and um, it'll become clear a little later on why uh, this is important um, compared to when we just look at the solubility in water on its own we don't see much difference between the crystalline and the amorphous form. But this is the dynamic solubility profile where we see the significant difference between the crystalline and the amorphous form in terms of the solubility. Um, and this then translates to a significant difference in the dissolution profiles 
from the amorphous, which is the red profile and the crystalline form. And in the case of some drugs, this difference in solubility um, is quite significant between the amorphous and, and the crystalline form, leading to significantly different uh, dissolution profiles. Um, so, for example, this is an example of ritonavir um, in the crystalline uh, versus the amorphous form, and this is looking at what's called intrinsic dissolution rates, where we keep the surface area constant. Uh, so it's not a particle size effect or anything like that. It's a purely a solubility effect, and we're seeing a tenfold increase in the in the dissolution rate. So significant dissolution rate enhancement can be achieved by using the same drug, but in a different solid state form. And there are some commercial products where the amorphous form of the drug is used in what we might call a, a conventional type formulation. Um, as opposed to some of the enabling formulations that I'll come to uh, a little later on. But with, with these um, formulations, the drug is presented in an amorphous form, but not in an amorphous solid dispersion form, which is a more common way of presenting amorphous uh, drugs as enabling formulations, which I, which I will come to. But with these drugs, if you're going to use the amorphous form of the drug in a conventional formulation, you have to be pretty sure that the drug is going to say stay st stable and stay in the amorphous state for the life uh, or for the shelf life of, of the product. And to ensure that that happens, the amorphous form of the drug has to have a, a reasonably high glass transition temperature and have been proven to stay physically and chemically uh, stable. So there are relatively few drugs that fit that bill. Now, it's not to say that there aren't other formulations of um, other drugs where the drug is presented in the amorphous form, but with these other formulations, they are enabling formulations where the drug is presented in the form of what's called an amorphous solid dispersion. And I'll explain now why we need to consider um, developing these drugs as amorphous solid dispersions. So this is a very nice uh, article that was presented by Alonzo et al. Uh, back in 2010. And they were looking at uh, philodipine as a model drug and looking at the dissolution profiles of amorphous philodipine versus crystalline philodipine. Okay? And looking at the dissolution at uh, two different temperatures, 25 degrees centigrade and 37 degrees centigrade. And different concentrations of um, the um, powder. Um, but interestingly, what was found here is that while the at 25 degrees centigrade, you get this huge uplift, if you like, in the dissolution profile initially, and then it kind of falls away. At 37 degrees centigrade, and with the same concentration of amorphous material as crystalline material, there's really no difference in the dissolution profiles. So the purple where I've drawn the purple line here, that's the amorphous uh, form at the same concentration as the crystalline one, uh, which it, it more or less overlays. Oh, sorry, actually, the crystalline one is the one that I've drawn the purple line in, but you see the amorphous one is just sitting just underneath it. So they're pretty much equivalent at 37 degrees. And why is that the case? Well, it's because if you look at the transformation kinetics, so this group used Raman spectroscopy to see what was happening to the solid material in the course of the dissolution profile. And they see that at 37 degrees centigrade, you're getting very rapid crystallization. So the drug, the amorphous form of the drug is crystallizing really before it's getting a chance to dissolve. Whereas at 25 degrees centigrade, that crystallization is retarded. So with that, you get you do get this benefit of the higher solubility and the higher dissolution rate of the amorphous form at 25 degrees, but not at 37. So in terms of using the amorphous uh, form of a drug and, and in harnessing the benefits provided by the higher solubility of the amorphous form, um, we need to be concerned with 
uh, keeping the drug in the amorphous state. Okay, so if we have the drug in the solid state, what we want to do is prevent crystallization of that form of the drug. Um, if we get the drug to to present in solution, so to dissolve and give us a supersaturated solution, which is what we'd hope to get from the amorphous form, we want to prevent that uh, supersaturated solution from nucleating too quickly and uh, giving us the crystalline form too quickly. So we want to get good supersaturation, but we want to maintain that supersaturated solution, and we want to avoid crystallization from the solid uh, state of the, the formulation as well. And this is, is where we look to use components in our formulation, excipients in our formulation, that will either stop this from happening or stop this from happening. And typically, uh, these are polymeric excipients. So in terms of stabilizing the amorphous form in the solid state, we can look at storage at low temperatures, as I said, maybe 50 degrees below the glass transition temperature, or we can use polymeric excipients. And these same polymeric excipients then, when we introduce the formulation into the liquid state, should also, we would hope, um, um, prolong the supersaturation of, in the solution that we see and prevent crystallization from the matrix. So these polymeric excipients, how do they act to improve the stability of the amorphous form? Well, they can increase the glass transition temperature, and this is what's known as an anti-plasticizing effect. If we get hydrogen bonding interactions between the, the drug and the polymer, um, that um, further enhances the, the uh, reduction in the molecular mobility, uh, which improves the stability of the amorphous form. And we also kind of get this barrier to diffusion presented by the polymer being intimately mixed with the drug molecules. Um, and so we get this barrier to diffusion, which inhibits this nucleation and crystallization. And so this is where we come to look at the use of solid dispersions as um, appropriate formulations for amorphous uh, drugs. And the early literature referred to solid dispersions as just mixtures of polymer and crystalline drugs, actually. And, and even when the drug was in the crystalline state, if the particle size was small enough and if there was an intimate mix between the drug and the polymer, you do get you did get some enhancement of dissolution. But increasingly now, amorph it's amorphous solid dispersions that we're concerned with, where we have an intimate mix of drug and polymer at the molecular level. And so we have what's often referred to as an amorphous dispersion or an amorphous solid solution or sometimes a molecular dispersion because we have this uh, intimate mixture at the molecular level. The ideal scenario is one like this. So we have this solid solution of drug intimately mixed with polymer. Um, what we would look to avoid is that we get phase separation where we get a separation of the crystalline phase from the the uh, polymer phase, or what we also like to avoid is phase separation, even when we don't yet have full crystallization, but we get phase separation in two separate amorphous phases. So we have a polymer rich phase and a API rich phase because the, the introduction of phase separation, even when there are amorphous states, is more likely to move to a scenario where we have phase separation with the drug in the crystalline form, which is what we want to avoid. So with amorphous solid dispersion, we have uh, introduced a polymer into the system, which should stabilize the amorphous drug, resulting in better physical stability in the solid state. But also, as I said, when we introduce these formulations into the liquid, into the liquid of our gastrointestinal tract, particularly, that we'll get higher apparent solubility, faster dissolution, and ultimately improved bioavailability from these um, hard to manage or hard to handle drugs of, with poor solubility. 
In a pharmaceutical manufacturing context, amorphous solid dispersions have largely been produced to date by one of two uh, methods, and that's spray drying or uh, hot melt extrusion. And this just presents a timeline of um, regulatory approval of some of these amorphous solid dispersions, and you'll see that you know things started off pretty slowly, but even you know as far back as the mid uh, 1980s, we saw some of the first of these um, formulations coming on the market, and then there was really an explosion of these ASD formulations in the um, I suppose the the late 2000s and going up as far as well, this only shows it going as far as 2016, but it, it has continued up to uh, current current date. And I suppose this just demonstrates that, you know, pharmaceutical companies initially perhaps were very hesitant to to look at the amorphous form as a viable option for their products. Um, but as there's been an increased understanding of the amorphous state and amorphous formulations, there is a growing, I would say, um, level of, of comfortableness, if that's the correct word, of handling, using and uh, producing amorphous materials and amorphous solid dispersions uh, that have found their way into uh, commercial production. As I said, so this, uh, this table here shows um, the range of different um, commercially available amorphous solid dispersions. Uh, the dosage form in which they're presented, and also the manufacturing method that's used. And, and as I said, in most cases, it's either spray drying or hot melt extrusion that, that have been used to date, although there are other options, for example, uh, precipitation or co-precipitation and uh, sugar spraying, sorry, spray drying or spray coating on sugar beads. So coming back to this scenario where we were looking at the amorphous philodipine and this issue of, OK, well, at the lower temperature, we do get some level of supersaturation into the liquid, but it's not really maintained. And at the higher temperature, we get such rapid crystallization um, from the solid uh, state that we really see no benefit from using the amorphous form at all. The same group look to see, well, what happens when you put some uh, polymer into the liquid into which you're looking for your amorphous form to dissolve? And they found that, well, if you introduce some polymer, at least the right polymer into the liquid, you can actually maintain um, the uh, level of supersaturation uh, for much longer, and you can get this supersaturation uh, to occur not only at 25 degrees centigrade, as they saw previously, but also now at 37 degrees centigrade. And looking at the transformation kinetics, the transformation kinetics in terms of the conversion from the amorphous to the crystalline state is much delayed in the presence of these various polymeric excipients. So this effect of having the polymer there and then the polymer going into solution along with the amorphous form of the drug provides what's um, commonly referred to as the spring and parachute effect. So what we want is to get this spring, this high uh, rate of dissolution and um, presentation of a supersaturated solution, which we can get from the amorphous form. But the polymer then is what provides the parachute to extend that drug concentration in solution in the supersaturated state so that it doesn't crash out immediately. And so we get this, this extended supersaturation, which provides for greater opportunity then for absorption in vivo in the gastrointestinal tract um, if we keep that supersaturated solution of the drug that was initially in the amorphous solid state form. And so this is the advantage that's provided by these amorphous solid dispersion formulations. And there are a range of different polymers that can and have been used in, in these uh, different formulations. And so the question is, well, how do you pick the right polymer, or is there a right polymer for, for a particular drug? 
And in reality, the polymer selection is still largely based on, on trial and error approaches. Um, you know, there are some polymers that are more suited to spray drying versus hot melt extrusion, for example. Um, but to match a, a polymer with a particular drug, you have to take into account things like the glass transition temperature, the solubility, the thermal liability, uh, the molecular rate, the hydrostabicity, and so on. Um, but we are looking for a polymer or a combination of polymers that will have the ability to maintain the drug in the amorphous form in the solid state, so during manufacture and storage and shipment, but also maintain the supersaturated solution state when the drug is, is presented in vivo and goes into solution in the body so that we get good absorption from that formulation. What makes a good polymer in an amorphous solid dispersion? Um, well, this just shows one example of where we looked at spray drying a range of thiazide um, compounds uh, with PVP as, as the polymer. And um, if you look at the, the thermal analysis of these systems, so um, if we just spray dried the drugs on their own, so that's uh, the thermograms are shown in A, B, C here, we see uh, this exotherm here. This exotherm represents uh, recrystallization of the amorphous form, right? So it crystallizes when we heat it and then we get um, a melting endotherm. In the solid dispersions that have been spray dried with polymer, you see you don't get this exotherm. So they are thermally, at least thermally stable. We're not getting this recrystallization ex exotherm. If we look at the glass transition temperatures um, relative to the weight fraction of polymer that we use, we see actually, so the, the squares or the triangles, the, the symbols here are the experimental profiles and, and the, the, the lines or the curves are, are um, modeled uh, glass transition temperatures. But it, the experimental profiles are, I guess, what are interesting. We see that we can get significantly higher glass transition temperatures than is predicted by simple models which don't incorporate any level of interaction between the drug and the polymer. Where we do get hydrogen bonding interaction, in particular between drug and polymer, we can significantly shift the glass transition temperature upwards, and that provides for significantly improved stability of our amorphous solid dispersion. We can, if we look at um, these types of phase diagrams where we're looking at uh, the glass transition temperature and we're looking at the solubility of the drug in the polymer, we can look at these phase diagrams to pick out regions where we should have maximum stability of drug in polymer in these amorphous salt dispersions. Because we, ideally we want to be below the supersaturation level of the drug in the polymer and below the glass transition temperature where we minimize the molecular mobility. So there, there are kind of ways in which we can more rationally design our amorphous solid dispersions rather than just uh, kind of using a trial and error approach. Uh, some more recent work that one of my PhD students did was looking at, um, you know, how, if we're looking at a particular polymer, how do we pick within a range of different options, and this is for um, PVPVA, uh, within a range of different options, how do we pick the best polymer to give us good stability, but also good uh, dissolution performance? And the polymer itself can, and subtle differences in the polymer that we choose can provide for very different performance characteristics of the ASD. So for example, here, the molecular weight of the polymer can give us different dynamic solubility profiles. The ratio of the uh, vinyl pyrolidone to vinyl acetate in the polymer can give us significantly different um, dynamic solubility profiles. And so in this work, uh, the student was looking, you know, for a particular polymer, um, what will be the effect on the ASD performance of the molecular weight, the, in this case, vinyl acetate versus uh, vinyl pyrolidone, uh, content and how can we relate the characteristics of the polymer to the ASD performance. Um, 
So I guess this is with a view to moving away a little bit from just a, you know, a trial and error approach where we stick in a load of different polymers with a different drug, mix them up, process them by different means and see what we get. Is can we be a little bit cleverer about the selection of our polymer constituent? The other thing we have to worry about then is the process. You know, what process are we going to use to generate the ASDs? And as well as the polymer, the process can have an effect on the ultimate uh, performance characteristics of our ASD. So here we need to think about the solubility of both the API and the polymer, the thermal stability of the API and the polymer, what loading of API are we looking for, what scale are we looking to work at, and do we want to work in a batch or continuous process? But even with the same drug polymer combination, we can see that two different processes can give us quite different results. Uh, so this is an example where we looked at spray drying versus milling uh, for the same drug polymer combination. But we see that with the top down approach spray drying, um, we can produce amorphous uh, ASD at a much lower polymer composition than we can hope to achieve with the um, sorry the the spray drying of course is the bottom up the milling is the the top down approach so with milling we need to use a lot more polymer to get the same outcome in terms of an amorphous solid dispersion that appears to be amorphous on the px or d um, and this was demonstrated for, for two different drugs. But if we do manage to get an amorphous solid dispersion, whichever form or whichever process we use to generate it, the performance characteristics of the ASD for these two different drugs with the same polymer um, ultimately end up being equivalent. So this is looking at dissolution rate enhancement um, for co-milled versus co-spray dried materials, initially uh, dissolution rate enhancement and limiting dissolution rate enhancement. Another process that we're currently working on and looking to compare um, is co-precipitation and looking to compare how does co-precipitation um, match up to spray drying, uh, which I guess is a more, more commonly used approach. Um, and, not, and not to dwell on, on this, um, but again, we see that uh, for this particular drug polymer combination, because there's a significant opportunity for a hydrogen bonding interaction, we get high glass transition temperatures much higher than the model predicted. And regardless of the process, we get in this case um, amorphous solid dispersion that are equivalent by PX or D and by uh, largely equivalent by DSE. OK, I focused a lot on, um, you know, how do we how do we harness the good aspects of amorphous solid dispersions? And in the last, I guess, five minutes or so, I'm going to speak a little bit about. Um, well, how do we avoid the bad? And I guess this is more so if OK, we 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 perhaps don't have an issue with solubility of a drug. We want to maintain the drug in a largely crystalline form. Um, we don't have, want to have to worry about using an amorphous form of the drug because we we don't want to worry about its physical uh, instability, perhaps, um, and so on. So how do we avoid generating or unnecessarily or unintentionally generating the amorphous form in a largely crystalline material? Um, and why do we want to avoid it? Uh, and so this is really just a repetition of what I said already, but one of the concerns of using amorphous materials is their inherent physical instability. They will inevitably try to crystallize to get to the lower energy crystalline state. And this can occur, um, you know, either relatively slowly. So this shows a, a material which is stored for one year at a relatively high humidity um, and on PX or D eventually does show a level of crystallization or it can occur much more quickly. So this shows another drug which when we spray dry it initially 
um, do a, a DSC really, really quickly. It shows that it's amorphous because we get the recrystallization exotherm on the DSC. But after an hour, it has crystallized uh, to a particular uh, polymorph polymorphic form. So sometimes these amorphous materials are just, you know, not feasible to, to manage or to handle uh, because they're just so physically unstable. The other big problem with using amorphous materials and even small amounts of amorphous materials is that they love to suck in moisture from the atmosphere um, and this presents problems um, can present problems with the processability of the powder, becomes agglomerated, hard to handle, um, and sometimes <clears throat> just completely unprocessable. We, we end up in this example of uh, hydrochlorothiazide with uh, PV, PVA and an amorphous solid dispersion. If you expose it to high humidity, you get this uh, sticky, bloopy mess um, from what once was a nice uh, free flowing powder. Even if we have small amount of amorphous material sitting on the surface of particles that frequently is generated by mechanical activation processes that we see in the milling, uh, these small amounts of amorphous material on the surface of the particles, they'll suck in moisture and that will lead to um, agglomeration as a result of solid or liquid bridge formation. So one strategy that we looked at a little bit to try and overcome this is to use uh, low glass transition temperature excipients and um, to mix them intimately with um, the amorphous form that we perhaps have unintentionally generated to get the excipient to trigger crystallization of the composite system. So this is almost like a reverse of using the high glass transition to polymeric components to stabilize the amorphous form. In this case, we want to intimately mix at the molecular level, low glass transition temperature crystalline excipients with amorphous material that might be unintentionally generated to drive down the glass transition temperature of the composite material and trigger crystallization so that any amorphous material that's generated is only temporarily there and it's switched back to the amorphous form. So here, what we're looking at is mixing a, a crystalline API with an excipient. What happens when you mill that mixture? If, and compare that to what happens when you mill uh, the crystalline API on its own. If you mill it hard enough for long enough, you can get it to be Come totally amorphous, but actually, if you pick the right excipient, right excipient with low enough glass transition temperature, you can. Um, okay, there may be temporary amorphization there, but you can trigger crystallization. And so here, this is just an example of sulfadimidine mixed with a range of different uh, crystalline excipients at 50-50 ratio, and we see that for one in particular, uh, glutaric acid which is a low glass transition temperature, it uh, can, uh, can prevent the amorphization of the mixture. Interestingly, the uh, Hildebrand solubility parameters of glutaric acid and our drug are very close. So the difference between them is very, very small and the excipient has a low glass transition temperature. And we can actually use uh, thermal methods to measure the solubility of the excipient, or sorry, the solubility of the excipient, the crystalline excipient in the amorphous API. Um, and we can estimate the solubility use looking at the heat of fusion uh, versus the excipient mass fraction. We can estimate the solubility for different excipients. And we see, so this shows an example of um, adipic acid versus glutaric acid. And we see that uh, the crystallinity um, increases and kind of plateaus out beyond the point where the excipient has maximum solubility in the uh, amorphous API. We also see that if we measure the glass transition temperature of the equivalent composite systems, that the glass transition temperature 
is decreasing and levels out beyond this maximum solubility point. Uh, we've demonstrated this um, for another drug. This is uh, salbutamol sulfate, where we estimate the amorphous uh, content by DVS, dynamic vapor absorption analysis. And again, interesting for a range of carboxylic acids, it's a glutaric acid that performed best in terms of minimizing amorphization. And again, the minimization of amorphization uh, kind of comes at the point at or just beyond the maximum solubility of glutaric acid in the amorphous uh, drug. So we know that the kind of the key points, and I know we're stuck for time, Sarah, so I, I'm going to wrap up. I think I've just a few more slides. Um, what we moved on to do is look at a, just a, a screening method where we looked at can we, by DSC, measure the TG? So we want a single TG that's pretty low. And can we relate that to selection of excipient? And we demonstrated for griseofulvin and budesonide that this screening approach can work. Using an excipient with a low TG that has good solubility in the amorphous API. So in conclusion then, in terms of amorphous materials, yes, there are a huge benefits to the formulation scientists in terms of their improved solubility and dissolution characteristics. There are challenges with respect to the physical instability of the amorphous form um, to allow us to harness the advantages. We need to, to be aware of the need to improve the physical instability. Um, amorphous solid dispersions provide an opportunity for us to harness these benefits of the amorphous state. Um, and where the amorphous form is an undesired contaminant of a large crystalline system, there are potential strategies that we can use to overcome this undesirable amorphization. And so with that, I'd just like to thank all the contributors to the work, uh, colleagues, postdocs, um, PhD students, um, the funding agencies, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Thank Thanks, sir. That was a, a fantastic talk. Um, so if anyone has any questions, uh, please just put up your hand and, and um, I, I can you can turn on your microphone or, or type it up in the chat. Uh, I might kick off with, with one question, Anne-Marie. Mm -hmm. um, so the, to, to define your particular amorphous state, um, DSC, really your TG kind of defines what that you have a, a particular amorphous state. So in general, do you find with the same, if you were to use, say, the same in your solid dispersions or even in a in a, a pure drug amorphous state, can you get, depending on how you process it, do you get, can you get a range of different amorphous states with different TGs? And then with that in mind, um, you know, we, we always talk about it and you presented a few examples of how maybe during dissolution you get uh, the amorphous state converts or transforms to the crystalline state. Do you ever see it transforming to a different amorphous state? Um, yeah, so in, interesting questions. I mean, I, I think we certainly do see different amorphous states in that there's this polyamorphism con concept. And if you think about the amorphous state, you know, OK, we don't have the three dimensional long range order, but we do have a level of short range order. So there can be different types of short range order. Um, so I, I guess to answer that first question, yes, you can have different amorphous states and different. Um, potentially different uh, levels or different short range order and and, and subtly different glass transition temperatures. Um, the other question in terms of crystallization, uh, what was this? Crystallization and will you get crystallization? But more do you ever see conversion from one amorphous state to another amorphous state during storage or during dissolution or anything like that? I don't know that you get direct conversion from one, or, uh, at least it's very difficult to see, you know, but yeah. you, I, I think what's more likely to see is that you'll get no, I don't think you'll see another discrete amorphous state. You'll get a more gradual transi transition from one amorphous state to the crystalline state. 
but yeah. it won't hop from one amorphous state to another amorphous state and then it's yeah, a lower energy amorphous state it no i mean you can get in you know an annealing effect where yeah. you can get a, a, a more yeah closer to equilibrium amorphous state but i don't know that you would call that a discrete different to, to isolate it or yeah yeah, yeah. 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 OK, excellent. Um, if anyone has any questions, I see a question there from Luis. Um, would it be appropriate to name polymorphism for different amorphous states? No, I mean, I don't I, 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 I you know, people use this term polyamorphism, um, yeah. which is what we've we've kind of said, you know, there are different levels of of short range order. But. But I think that's very hard to define, you know, I mean, polymorph a polymorph is very easy to define and is very easy to characterize it's you can't how do you determine that something is a discreetly different level of amorphous nature because it by its nature it's completely disordered right so what makes it disordered in one way compared to another way i don't i don't think so so just to follow up on that you know like for I guess it would be a, a shift in your TG or potentially in solid state and more. If you saw a shift in any peak position, it might be different. Yeah, but I think the, the problem is it's it's going to be a kind of a continuum, right? Yeah, you, I'd you, agree. You, yeah, absolutely. You're not going to see one discrete amorphous state and then another discrete amorphous state. Whereas with crystalline materials, they, they're very discrete solid state forms. But in the case of solid dispersions, do you think you could have very discrete amorphous forms when you use a different polymer, for example? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. You could have. And also with uh, solid dispersions, you, you will get this difference between do I have, you know, a completely intimately mixed polymer drug system or do I have a system where I have polymer rich phase versus API rich phase? You know? yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I have another question. I, I have loads of questions, but I'll just ask this one more and then I'll, I'll see if anyone else for, that's in the audience have, have another question. Like, you know the way um, more and more complex APIs are kind of coming through the pipeline in terms of, you know, higher molecular weights, for example, things like amphotericin B or just higher molecular weights and what we find molecules that are more difficult to crystallize. Do you think that with some of these larger, more complex, still small molecule, but they have solubility challenges, they've quite a degree of um, flexibility within the molecular structure. Do you think that amorphous formulations will play a greater role um, in getting these types of molecules to the market and getting them to succeed? Yeah, and I, I think we're already seeing that. You know, I think there are companies that um, that have already moved to to as I said earlier, be more comfortable in using the amorphous form, um, and molecules that would have been dead in the water previously because they only wanted to consider a crystalline stable, physically stable form, um, they are coming through to later stage development now because of the opportunity provided by amorphous solid dispersions. Yeah, I mean, they've been around now for for a couple of decades, so it's not necessarily a new technology anymore. I think people are more comfortable with it. There's still lots to be learned about them, and yeah. you know, which is great because we wouldn't have PhD students, postdocs working on them otherwise. But um, but I think from a commercial product point of view, there's um, opportunities there that the companies are seeing and the, and that's enabling them to bring through more of these large molecule hard to handle drugs. Yeah, yep, excellent. Um, OK, so is there any other questions from anyone in the audience? Oh, I think does someone have their hand up there yet? So Harsh, if you want to unmute yourself, do, yeah. did you have your hand up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was a really interesting talk. Thank you. So thank you for that. So my question was regarding uh, the polymer selection. So sometimes like if a particular polymer uh, is stabilizing amorphous form in a solid state, but it may fail during the solution state stabilization. So is there a way to anticipate uh, such failures or like can we screen polymers 
uh, can cause both the kinds of stabilization as in the solid state and the solution state. Yeah, I mean, there are, um, I have it on another slide, but I didn't show it. There are kind of, you know, um, selection mat matrices, if you like, or work or workflows that allow you to choose particular polymers might be better for spray drying versus hot melt extrusion and so on. Particular polymers might have greater benefit in terms of the physical stability in solid, solid state versus enhancing solubility in the liquid state. And in early stage product development, companies will typically screen a range of polymers, both for the physical stability by doing like accelerated stability study, and they'll screen the dissolution characteristics or the solubility characteristics. So they'll do those in tandem. And often uh, with newer products that are coming through now, they won't just depend on a single polymer. They'll use a combination of polymers. Um, because you're right, you know, some are particularly good at keeping it in the amorphous state in the solid dosage form, and others are better when it comes to the in vivo situation and enhancing or maintaining that supersaturation. Um, so what I've seen is that now companies are looking to use smart combinations of polymers to get benefit in both aspects. Yeah, and then that makes sense. So, yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so if there's no more questions, uh, I see we lost a couple of people just in the last few minutes, Anne-Marie, who had lectures at one o'clock, yeah. but um, a lot of thanks for the great talk um, from lots of people. So just to, to thank you again for today, a really interesting talk. And um, I think uh, everyone learned a lot. And when we struggle to crystallize, we might be picking your brains again about some amorphous formulation. Don't crystallizing. Just yeah. <laughs> what happens to my whole team then in the SSBC? <laughs> well, thank you very much for today. All right. Thanks, Thanks. everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.